Asiatic steps, they on the goony under the seat. If you can walk without an L, then you can run with a G and feel the rhythm. This episode of Based on a Feature new music from Sean Love's post retirement hip hop album, Postcards from the Bay. And Miko Brando's debut EP, Lemonade, Lemonade. Una chica universitaria se une a un programa de gobierno para enterarse que ha desarrollado superpoderes junto con otros nuevos amigos. Ahora ella hará todo lo posible para escapar del programa Gen 13. Hola, yo soy Ivana Ramone y bienvenidos sean todos a Twitchy One, basado en con las participaciones especiales de Kevin Altieri, Karen Colus, Sharon Eric Denton y John Dilezzi. Bye. Based on a comic book. And all the whores and politicians will look up and shout, Save us. And I'll whisper, No. Based on a video game. Based on a cartoon. Save the human race. Our star blazer. 2G1 presents. Based on a... Hey everybody, I'm Ryan from 2G1 and welcome to the third episode of our series Based On It, which looks at films in the comic books and movies that they are based on. Image Comics ruled the scenes in the 1990s and there might have been no bigger image book than Gen 13. Now an animated film was completed based on the comic book, but it never saw the light of day. Why? Today we're going to explore that answer, along with all new interviews from Gen 13 director Kevin Altieri, producer Karen Kolitz, star John Delancey and former Gen 13 editor Shannon Eric Denton. Image comic books had taken the world by storm when they launched in 1992. The imprint from Malibu Comics consisted of seven big name artists who left Marvel at the same time, looking for big money, more control, and the ability to own their own characters. Overnight, the superstars launched into the stratosphere with Todd McFarlane's Spawn, Jim Valentino's Shadowhawk, Jim Lee's Wildcats, Rob Liefeld's Youngblood, Mark Silvestri's Cyberforce, and Eric Larson's Savage Dragon. A seventh title, Wetworks, was also planned for the launch by superstar Will Sportaccio, but Private Matters delayed that comic until a few years later. Gen 13 was not one of those initial books, but one of several comics that expanded Jim Lee's Wildstorm line, which also included Stormwatch, Deathblow, and Wetworks. Gen 13's first appearance would not be in their 1994 miniseries, but rather a book called Deathmate Black. Deathmate was a company crossover between Image Comics and Valiant Comics, who was having huge success in the early 90s thanks to their own superhero line. Deathmate was not well received. While the books produced by Valiant Comics arrived in comic stores on time, the Image books, like Black, which was produced by Wildstorm, and Deathmate Red, which was produced by Rob Liefeld's Extreme Comics, saw constant delays. Some thought the books would never even reach stores at all. When they did reach comic stores, readers didn't really seem to care, and thousands of copies quickly found their ways into quarter and dollar bins, and the first appearance of Gen 13 went basically unnoticed. That would all change significantly with the launch of Gen 13's five-issue miniseries in 1994. The series would be co-created and penciled by newcomer J. Scott Campbell, whose striking artwork drew audiences in just from the cover art of issue one alone. Campbell was no stranger to having his work noticed. At just 15 years old, Campbell had won a Nintendo Power contest with a video game concept he had conceived. The video game story and art was published in an issue seen by thousands of Nintendo fans. Five years later, Campbell was drawing his first book for a major publisher. Gen 13 was about a young woman named Caitlin Fairchild, attending school at Princeton University. Unknown to her, her father was a part of a team called Team 7, a group of soldiers with gen-active superpowers. Fairchild is recruited to Project Genesis and joins other recruits like Roxy, aka Freefall, Grunge, and Bobby, aka Burnout. The project is headed by the sadistic Havana, joined by the brother and sister team Threshold and Bliss, 
who subsequently torture the kids to try and make their powers begin to work. Eventually, the Quintet, as Sarah, aka Rainmaker, joins the group, quickly develop their powers. With the help of Lynch, an old teammate from Team 7, the kids are able to break out from Project Genesis and start a new life together as a superhero team that sometimes cares less about being heroes and enjoying the fun of being teenagers. Former Gen 13 editor at Wildstorm DC Comics, Shannon Eric Depp. I think because, you know, they were still the uh, heroic uh, journey that you could join in, but uh, they, were, they, were, they were relatable because of the age. You know, it was basically the age of our readers uh, when the book debuted. Everybody that was working on the book, um, you know, we we're all fans of the characters, so it was a lot of putting as much as we could into the project. Kevin Altieri was at a career high in the animation world in 1994. The animator, having previously worked on animated series versions of Rambo and ALF, plus the incredible Futuristic Cops, which really was a favorite of mine, had just completed several years on Batman the Animated Series, including work on the animated feature Batman, Mask of the Phantasm. With the production of that series completing, Altieri was looking for a new project to tackle. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. I, was, I mean, I was at Warner Brothers, and I was pretty happy all the way through the Adventures of Batman and Robin, which was pretty much just Batman the Animated Series. There was no difference. I had a dream of uh, what I wanted to do, direct the video, action-adventure, superhero cartoons. And I had the concept of just selling them direct to the comic shops. I ended up talking to Jim Lee. As one of them, and Jim was on board, he really wanted to finance it, and of all of his properties, Gen 13 was the hot ticket at the time. It was like a really big seller, really big seller at the time, uh, which is why Jim, Jessica Campbell, and Brandon were like, you know, hot to do it. And I, I got like a really great deal, I don't know, it was like after all the earthquakes then, so I was able to get like a great deal on Main Street in Santa Monica which is just literally a block from the beach where I surf almost every day. So it was kind of like paradise for me anyway. And the original vision was that we were going to have like a full-on crew, but it was pretty much me, Karen Colas, um, Jennifer, our PA, and, <laughs> and me and Shane in an office in Santa Monica, a pretty small production. And a very, and it was a very small and tight budget too. There are people who are telling me that you know, Disney spent all sorts of money on it, but they didn't spend a cent. <laughs> no, it was it was a very small budget. Gen 13 producer Karen Collis. How I started with Kevin was way back on Batman. So I ended up as his production assistant, and the way they worked that show was I would break down the scripts and um, and then break down the storyboards and there was no computer so everything was hand drawn and you had to figure out everything that needed to be drawn for the show. Apparently I was one of the few people who could really work with Kevin because he talked with Kevin, he's kind of a wacky guy. Um, but we got along really well, we worked really well together. And then I went off and did something else and he called me up and said, I'm doing this. Um, Gen 13 show, do you want to do it? I came at producing really as a production manager and making sure that all the elements we needed were done and then I filled in from there. They were running into problems because people couldn't read storyboards. So they wanted a script and they asked me to write the script. So Kevin had already started something because he storyboarded and I physically wrote the script and it was one draft, that was it. There was no rewrite, no nothing, which is a little bit of a shame. It only went one draft and Kevin ended up using it and <laughs> there you have it. It was kind of crazy. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. Jack Fletcher was our voice director and pretty much we sat down and says, okay, who do you want? And I said, well, I know Mark Hamill's on board, you know, just because at that time, Mark liked, just liked doing this stuff. And this is the only time that I, would, I wanted him, I wanted Mark Hamill. I wanted that Luke Skywalker voice, that just his voice. So, this is the great master they send to instruct me. 
So this is actually one of the very few times that you'll actually hear is, you know, Mark Campbell's voice just as he is. And Cloris Leachman, I just, Helga is a character that we kind of pumped up a little bit, you know, because we could use her to bring the characters in a little more. Um, and all I could think of was Cloris Leachman. Jack reached out, we got Cloris Leachman. John Delancey. I mean, that was that was uh, Jack's suggestion because he says, "Okay, who do you see for Lynch?" And I said, "Richard Boone, Jack Palance would have been great, you know." And then he says, "You know, how about John Delancey?" And they went, "Oh, Q, yes, <laughs> you know." And it's like he's perfect, perfect actor. Just has a rich, deep voice. And Alicia Witt was like she was on Sybil at the time. She was like 19 when she did uh, Caitlin. She could have just played it. If it was live action, she could have just played the role. E.G. Daly, that's another person. It's like, <laughs> when I wanted to do it, I just went E.G. Daly, Roxy. And and it was just like, I wanted that girl that was in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. That's the perfect voice. All I knew was like, I wanted Mark Hamill and E.G. Daly. <laughs> you know, I just wanted those two, you know, coming out, coming out of the box. And Flea was, um, never even dawned on me that you could have gotten him. I think it was his first voice acting job. And as a bit of trivia, most of the recording that you hear of his voice, his performance, was done from his audition. Because he showed up after a concert with his, you know, throat torn up. So he was kind of raspy. A lot of the more tender stuff, you know, where he's like trying to wake Roxy up after she's been tortured and he, and he manifests for the first time. That's like, that was actually Flea, like, that was from his audition. It's really, he couldn't get a better performance than that. You know, it was just, it was just a great job. Gen 13 producer, Karen Collis. Everything was G or it was Spawn, which was like closer to R. There really wasn't anything like that. So you really had to think differently about how you were casting it. Kevin went with names he knew that he really wanted in there, like E.G. Daly and Mark Hamill. He'd worked with both of them. We had trouble finding Caitlin. I suggested Alicia Witt, and I think Jack went and got her. And I also suggested Lauren. Lauren Lane. Yeah, Laura Lane. I suggested her. I said, take. We were we were looking at who was on television at the time and who had interesting voices. And those two were very specifically my suggestions, and they liked them. And um, that was really fun. It was really fun to have a say in that. With Alicia Witt cast as Fairchild, E.G. Daly as Roxy, Flea voicing Grunge, along with Mark Hamill as Threshold, John Delancey as Lynch. Cloris Leachman as Helga, and Lauren Lane as Ivana, the primary voice cast of Gen 13 was assembled and ready to go. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. The recordings were awesome. Lauren Lane came in from Arizona. You know, she flew out specifically for the recording. Cloris Leachman came in with her two little dogs and a giant hoagie sandwich. She was just nibbling on it while she was in the booth. Really, really great. The recording, we recorded her a couple of times doing all the lines. What you hear on um, on the movie is Cloris Leachman's very first stab, you know, just out of the gate. That was her first take. She just came in and said, so who is this person? Who do you want? And I said, I just want Frau Bluker. <laughs> <laughs> and boom. <laughs> Nailed it. Gen 13 star, John DeLancey. I remember sitting next to uh, Flea and sort of joking with him about all his tattoos in a funny sort of way. And I remember the sound stage and the sound booth, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is a really great cast. And I think that Jack had recommended me, I guess, uh, and the offer came down the pipe. I don't recall that I had to audition for it. Probably the reason that I went ahead and did it. You know, sometimes... You know, it's, it's the three three things that actors, you know, you know the material, the money, the, the location. So, you know, it's those are the three actor questions that always have to be answered first. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. I needed more time and more money, but 
Mark was like a trooper. He actually put in more effort and more time than I or the studio could afford. And John Delancey, he just said, no, no, I, he wasn't happy with a bit of his performance. So, you know, and I said, well, you know, the guy was great. But both Mark and John Delancey, they're like, don't worry about the clock. Just you know, I, let, let, let me be happy with my performance. And I'll, you know, don't worry. Gen 13 star, John Delancey. You're somebody kept on telling me, you'll be able to do all this in an hour. You know, don't keep on saying that because that's, that's not the part that's enticing to me that somehow I can blow it off even faster than normal or something like that. I'm there. As far as I'm concerned, you have bought me for the day. And while you might think that we can do it in less than an hour, if it takes three hours, then it'll take three hours. I mean, I'm there to do as absolutely as good a job as I can possibly do. Let's do, you know, we'll start off with three takes and then, you know, let's do three more and then after that, let's do three more after that. You do as good a job whether you're being paid X amount or three times X amount. Gen 13, the animated movie, is a fairly faithful adaptation of the original Gen 13 miniseries. Fairchild is recruited from Princeton University. Miss Fairchild? Yes. Hi, I'm Special Agent Barker with the National Security Committee. I believe that your uncle has told you we've been trying to contact you. The Project Genesis, where she meets friends Roxy and Grunge. <gasps> well, truly sorry about that. It's okay, just get off me. Don't mind Grunge, honey. He's just got a problem taking his vitamins. I'm Roxy. Caitlin Fairchild. Well, welcome to the club, Caitlin Fairchild. The three are put through rigorous training by Helga and Threshold until Caitlin develops her powers. Holy shit! What's the freaking grenade? She escapes Project Genesis, but makes her way back to free Roxy and Grunge, who are being tortured. Kill her. <gasps> The trio then fight Threshold. Give me a lift! In the end, Lynch brings the kids together to form a team. You have powers you've barely begun to understand. I'd like us to work together. All right, I accept. What can I say? Sounds cool! There are some changes made for the film. This is the last person that you want to harm. Caitlin is your sister. What? A major plot point is the removal of Threshold's sister Bliss and a reveal that Fairchild is actually his sister. Two of the five team members are missing. Both Burnout and Rainmaker are not a part of the team in this film. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. We had to do things like Burnout and Rainmaker. Great characters. But where do you draw the line? I mean, how many characters can you support on a, on a tiny budget? Actually, it was like, it's funny because, like, layout wise and drawing wise, she came out to be one of the best characters. Dominate, Cat! Dominate! All right. You want some more? Rainmaker shows up for a few quick scenes. She shows up during the treadmill training sequence, and another as she's locked in her room. Rainmaker's big scene is the peagle stick training sequence, where Fairchild and Rainmaker square off against each other, as the rest of the mostly unseen Project Genesis candidates watch. Though Rainmaker had these appearances, her interactions with Fairchild are limited, and with Roxy and Grunge non-existent. Child, hit the showers. Combo! Smarting! Yo, hop! It's also not true that Burnout doesn't appear in the film. According to Kevin Altieri's storyboards, 
The blonde character here featured next to Grunge in Roxy is actually Burnout. The character never speaks and is relegated to being a glorified cartoon extra, but he does appear in the film. There's another big scene in the film that never appeared in the book, and that is the shower scene, which does add some texture and depth to both the characters of Fairchild and Roxy. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. Karen came in and wrote a script based on boards that I had already done, but then adding things like the conversation with the girls in the shower, that's pure Karen. Gen 13 producer, Karen Collis. I know that, you know, when he, ha he has them sitting on the floor, and I know that several of us ladies were like, yeah, that would never happen. That was, that was Kevin. <laughs> no girl would ever do that. The shower scene is just one of several pieces okay. that make... Did he tell you about the boobs? What, which part with the boobs? Gen 13 producer, Karen Collis. So he drew it in the storyboard. So this is, this is my relationship with Kevin. He is that kid that will go right to the edge of what he's not allowed to do and cross it. And he did that all the time on Batman, too. So he drew it in there. And I said, you can't draw that in there because they're going to animate it if you do that. And we can't have that. You can't see the nipple. He goes, it'll be covered in layout. I'll make a note. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, you can't do it. Sure enough, they animated. In the early versions, you could slow it down and catch that one cell. That one cell where you can see the nipples. Like, oh, that's Kevin. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. The shower scene had to keep adding overlays of steam because they're just animated naked and the animation is very subtle the shower scene is just one of several pieces that makes the film feel more adult there is a moment when fairchild manifests her powers and is for a brief time naked in the opening scene lifted straight from the comic we see a man trying to save his young children who end up being threshold and fairchild while being hunted down he is killed in a barrage of gunfire, and blood is profuse. This opening scene truly sets the tone for a more PG-13 R-rated feel to the project. But all was not well for the Gen 13 film. While Kevin Altieri worked on completing the film, Wildstorm owner Jim Lee was working several deals. One of those deals was for the Gen 13 film to be purchased and distributed by Buena Vista Pictures, which is owned by the Disney Company. On top of that, Jim Lee was also talking to DC Comics to purchase all of Wildstorm's characters. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. There was that period where everything was being animated overseas, and Jim called me up and said, hey, we're making this deal with Disney for Gen 13. And I'm like, no, don't do it. And I said, why? Because they shelve everything. That's what Disney does. And so he says, no, nah, it doesn't make any sense. Why would someone want to do that? Sounds like a good deal, and I'm like, oh my god. And Disney did what they always did back then. But Disney kind of left that loophole that, you know, it was still got distributed overseas. Internationally, the film was distributed by Paramount Pictures. Copies usually found today will have the Paramount logo in front of the film, if it has a logo at all. The other side of that is that the film was released basically as an incomplete film. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. Whatever, when you're seeing Gen 13, with you know what what got what got released, what you're seeing film-wise is a film that's not quite complete. It's pretty much a work. The inevitable happened with Disney owning the Gen 13 film. It meant they owned a film to which they did not own the actual property. That property, of course, is owned by a rival film studio, as Warner Brothers is the parent company of DC Comics. To make matters worse, just a few years later, Disney would buy Marvel Comics, therefore being in direct competition not only as a film studio, but as a comic book publisher as well. The Gen 13 movie would remain shelved and never released on home video. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. I mean, all the assets still exist somewhere. There's a warehouse full of all the cells that Jim Lee, I guess, stored. And I've got some cells myself. There is all these assets and stuff that still exist. So the movie could be put together. It could be digitally remastered. Over 20 years later, the largely unseen film is fondly remembered by those involved with the production of the film and the comics. Gen 13 editor, 
Shannon Eric Denton. Well, I'd actually seen a, a cut of it, I think back at Fox Kids. Someone had it on a VHS tape, so we had watched it. It was definitely cutting edge at the time. Gen 13 producer, Karen Collis. You look at it now and you're like, oh, I've seen stuff like that or I've seen stuff done better, but there wasn't anything like it at the time. And it was such a strange, maverick little production. Gen 13 star, John DeLancey. It saddens me to hear that, for whatever reason, it hasn't been shown. If this is a show that everybody else feels needs to get a second chance, then absolutely. Gen 13 director, Kevin Altieri. It was a great time. I mean, in the end, you know, it's like, yeah, I kind of got screwed out of the big distribution and stuff. But for a few years, it's like we fucking lived in downtown Santa Monica. It was a great place, great time. And um, I got to I got to draw these characters I really loved. Who's your dream heroine? My favorite has always been Caitlin Fairchild from Gen 13. You couldn't handle that. Oh, I could definitely handle that. <laughs> Gen 13 is fondly remembered, even if the characters have only been sporadically seen in DC Comics in recent years. The team did appear in the pages of the new 52 Supergirl, but were relegated to guest appearance status. The only real survivor is Fairchild, who will be seen as a supporting character in the pages of Superboy before leading her own team called the Ravagers. Fairchild was most recently seen in the pages of Starfire. It continues to pop up in other DC titles. Former Gen 13 editor, Shannon Eric Dent. I think that IP is always going to resonate. Costumes may, you know, may change over the years, but uh, I, I think the love and the passion that got put into it uh, at the beginning uh, amongst all the creators will we'll translate. It wouldn't surprise me that, you know, somebody somewhere is going to see an opportunity for these characters. They're a lot of fun, and I think fun's always going to be in style. It just remains to be seen if Gen 13 will ever receive a proper release. But as Kevin Altieri has already stated, all of the assets for the film still exist. So a new Blu-ray, digital, or even 4K release is still a possibility. Now, before anyone says Disney would never, ever do that, just remember, this is the company that traded a sportscaster, Al Michaels, to NBC Universal for Oswald the Rabbit. So, I would say... Anything is possible. First and foremost, thank you to the gorgeous Vanna Ramon for opening the episode with her free fall cosplay. Check out Vanna's Instagram for a look at more of her photos, including more of her fantastic cosplay. As always, thank you so much to Josie Ritchie for providing the ASL for this episode. You can check out Josie's YouTube and more via the links in the description below. One day, when suddenly One day, I'm rapping to hear my own self rap and validate my memory. The music for this episode was provided by Sean Love off of his album Postcards from the Bank. Silence in the air. And Miko Brando off of their debut EP Lemonade Lemonade. Both of these kick ass albums are available on Bandcamp. Links provided below. Special thanks to my special guests, Karen Colas, Shannon Eric Denton, and John DeLancey for taking time out of their busy schedules to talk Gen 13 with me. Check out an Episode 3 Extra with John DeLancey talking the My Little Pony brony phenomenon in the description below. I can't thank director Kevin Altieri enough. Not only could I talk to him for hours, but the amount of material he provided for this episode was invaluable, from his interview to the amazing never-seen materials seen in this episode. Check out more of Kevin's amazing work with his new series, Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters, currently on its third season on Netflix. Thanks for watching. It really helps if you like, subscribe, and comment below, especially if you like what you saw today. We'll be back with another episode of Based on a but until then, this is Ryan from 2G1, and I'll see you next movie. Floating like a ghost, gotta keep eyes on you. You'll sneak up behind me, touch me and I'm through. Unless I'm feeling big, just get a little bit, be little, it's hard to resist. The physical thrill of jumping on top of you for the kill. Before Alan Moore took the character to great new heights, before Wes Craven took us into a nightmare on Elm Street, there was a swap monster that skirted the lines between environmental superhero and supernatural horror. Now hear the stories behind the scenes of the comics and the films. We learned the terrible 
terrible, terrible lesson. Wes had to try to figure out how to shoot everything, and he had like between one and two minutes to do it. And they sent me a screenplay, and by the time I got to the end, I was bleeding out of my eyeball. It was just so awful. Dick Giordano and I finished the story up, and he told me that uh, I heard there was a, a problem with the issue. I know I didn't get any work from DC for oh, about six months. It was an orgy scene that had nobody from the film in it. One of the head guys called me and said he was sending a car to get it. And I wouldn't give it to him until I felt like it had been reported correctly. 2G1 presents Based On It, Episode 4, Swamp Thing, with all new interviews from special guests, David Micheline, Dan Day, Peter David, Michael Uslan, Mark Verheiden, and a very special appearance by Adrian Barbo. Sometimes there were gators, but overall it was a nice shoot. I had a good time.